Okay, we're going to start out this morning in 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. One of the most important verses in the entire New Testament, and that's why all the modern versions have attacked it. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now there's a couple things in there that are very important. Okay, first of all, let's point out it's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not, hey, if you feel like it, you can study the Bible in your own time, in your free time. No, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. What happens if you don't study? What happens if you don't rightly divide the word of truth? Well, God's ashamed of you. You make make a mess of the Bible when you don't rightly divide the word of truth. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. What happens when people do not approach the Bible dispensationally? They cause the Bible to contradict. And then they have to twist the scriptures to try and make the whole Bible fit together. The whole Bible doesn't fit together. Just as a way of kind of explaining this, um, I just want to tell a little story here quickly. My younger sister, as most of you know here today, um, my younger sister just sold her house, her and her husband, and uh, they got to look for a new place. They don't have one yet, but when they do find a new house, then they're going to have to move their belongings from one house to another. Okay. Now, there are two ways that they can move. The one way is to get boxes and then to go to each individual room and label the box. Bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, like that. And then to take those things and to organize them into the boxes. Okay. The other way that they can do it is just to get boxes and just grab things from each of the rooms and throw them into the boxes. Now, which way is easier? Grabbing things from any room and just throwing them in boxes, that's a lot easier. But what's the outcome? The outcome is you move to the new house, and now you got this big pile of boxes there, and you have no idea what's in those boxes. And it ends up being worse, you know, because you were lazy and you didn't do it the right way. The best thing that you can do is rightly divide those things from those different rooms. And, you know, the Bible's kind of like that. The Bible is like a house. Okay, And there are different rooms in this house. And each room, there are things that can go into the different rooms. You know, right there is a candlestick. Okay, A candlestick can go into the kitchen, it can go into the bathroom, it can go into the bedroom, living room, dining room, wherever. But what about a toilet? Can you put a toilet in a living room? No. You don't want to. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't want to. But the point is... A house, every house has to have a place to eat, a place to sleep, a place to get clean, okay? Or go to the bathroom, you know. Every house has to have those three basic areas, all right? And the Bible, to say that the whole Bible is just all one thing and nothing changes and it's just all one great big room, well, no. That's not the way that you... Rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, turn over to chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And we're going to see what the purpose of the Bible is. 2 Timothy three fifteen, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All right, notice a couple things there very quickly. Timothy had the holy scriptures. From a child. He did not have the original autographs. He had copies. Of course, you know, we had a good message on that a couple month or two ago. Um, but what's the purpose? To make thee wise unto salvation through faith. We're going to look at that a little bit later too. Faith alone versus faith plus works. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, so you have four purposes of scripture. 
doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. And it says all scripture. Okay, so we do not teach that you are forbidden to look at any other part of scripture than the Pauline epistles or something. We don't teach that. All scripture, okay, can be used for instruction and righteousness. But doctrinally, you have to be careful. And that's what we're going to look at here in this study. Okay, turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. Now, there's a movement within dispensational teaching called hyper-dispensationalism. Now, they have most of their disp dispensations correct, but the church age, which we now live in, they blow that. And I'm just going to spend a couple minutes here on hyper-dispensationalism. And they say that only the Pauline epistles are for Christians today. Nothing else. Anything written by Paul is for Christians. Anything else, not for you. Now, we don't agree with that. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where are the, Lord, where are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ? The four Gospels. You are to consent to the four Gospels. And it's Paul that wrote that. Okay, so in the Pauline epistles, Paul is saying, consent to the four Gospels. You better consent to the words of Jesus Christ. Uh, let's finish, finish the verse here. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, verse 4, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. All right, turn to Romans chapter 16, verse 7. And I'm going to show you another reason why hyperdispensationalism does not work. Now, they teach that from the crucifixion till Paul was one body, and then from Paul till the rapture is another body. Well, that's heresy. And here, uh, here's why. Roman, Romans chapter 16, verse 7 says, here's Paul speaking, he says, salute. Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. So there were people in Christ before Paul showed up. So the hyperdispensationalism thing, Cornelius Stamm, um, E.C. Moore, uh, there's a Bullinger guy, I forget what his first name is, but the point is, it's a, it's a heretical call. Okay, and they take something that is scriptural, dispensational teaching, and they make an overemphasis on one of the dispensations. So that's not anything that you should mess around with. Okay, now we're going to look at some of the things where you cannot, you know, some of the dispensational differences, and if you try to bring the two together and mesh them together, it doesn't work. We're going to look at some of the right divisions in scripture. So turn over to the book of Hebrews. Now there's a lot of controversy, you know, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Well, I do believe it was Paul. And I haven't seen any reason why I shouldn't believe that. So I do think that this was written by Paul to the Hebrews, okay, the Jews. Now remember that, that's going to come in a little bit later too. But Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant." And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Okay, now let me just stop there for just a minute here. What's that talking about? The Old Testament. The Levit Levitical priesthood 
and the temple, the tabernacle there where they would go in and they would make sacrifices, animal sacrifices, to pay for the sins of the people. Okay? Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 9. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and cardinal or ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Well, what's the time of reformation? Verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the internal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. When did the New Testament start? Matthew chapter 1. That's the beginning of the New Testament. Uh, yep. Wrong. It started with the death of the testator. Okay, the blood, when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, that's when the New Testament began. Not before then. And we're going to look at that. Turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And here's where people start messing the Bible up because they'll go to Matthew, the whole book of Matthew, and they try to say, well, this is all just uh, for us today. This is for Christians. Old Testament for the Jew, New Testament for the Christian. Nope, doesn't work that way. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Well, we'll look at verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That term, kingdom of heaven, refers to an earthly, physical, visible kingdom. We're going to look at that in just a minute here. But it only appears in the book of Matthew. Nowhere else in the Bible does this term, kingdom of heaven, appear. Turn over to Matthew 4.17. There you had John the Baptist preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And here, Matthew 4.17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So yeah, John the Baptist and then Jesus Christ, both preaching this gospel of the kingdom of heaven. All right, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. We're going to see exactly what this kingdom of heaven is. A lot of people say, well, that's just the realm where God is. That's heaven, you know. That's what the kingdom of heaven is. No, it isn't. Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, we've all been over this time and time again, but the fact is, is that heaven? Is this where God is? The violent take it by force? Has God lost control of heaven? No. What's he talking about? He's talking about the earthly, physical, visible kingdom with the head, the, the capital city of this kingdom being Jerusalem. And probably no, no city in the history of man has been fought over as much as Jerusalem. They're fighting right now. You know, probably as I'm speaking, if you could like call over to Jerusalem and say, hey, put the phone out the window, you'd probably hear gunshots. <laughs> you know, it's just fighting all the time. The violent take it by force. This has nothing to do with a the spiritual realm, this heaven where God dwells. That's not what they're preaching. Okay, Jesus Christ was the king, and he came, and he offered himself as the king to Jerusalem. Okay, But we're going to see here, this is not the gospel that we preach today. Matthew 8, verse 4. Turn back there quickly, and we're going to see this thing about the fact that in these first couple chapters of Matthew, before the crucifixion, 
These people are still in the Old Testament, doctrinally. Matthew 8, verse 4. And Jesus saith unto him, See, thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Hmm. The uh, gift that Moses commanded, show thyself to the priest? How do you reconcile that with Christian doctrine? You don't. It's Old Testament. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now is that for today? No. Uh, go not into the way of the Gentiles? There's not one of us here today that's a Jew. So was it a sin for somebody to come and witness to us? No. Well, something changed then. You see, you're dealing with Old Testament here. Matthew chapter 1 up until the crucifixion is Old Testament. So you have to be very careful. There was a, there was a verse here in Galatians 4. I don't know if you were going to hit on it or not. But it says in Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Yeah. Yeah. So he was under the law. No, I didn't have that down. Yeah, that's a good point. Very good point. Now we're going to go to another one that they do typically. Turn to Romans chapter 13. Can anybody here tell me the fourth commandment? Commandment number four, what is it? Keep the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Yep, that's commandment number four. Now a lot of people are going around today and they're saying that worshiping on Sunday is evil and wrong and it's like taking the mark of the beast. You know, the Seventh day Adventists are big on that. But then a lot of people are getting into this thing that you should be worshiping only on the Sabbath day. We're going to see about that. And that, you know, of course they'll say about we have to keep the Ten Commandments. And it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But Romans 13 verse 9 gives the Ten Commandments or the commandments that we're to follow as Christians. And look at what Paul says here. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly com comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Where is remember the Sabbath day? It's not in there. And I'm going to show you why it's not in there. Ezekiel 20, verse 19. Going to be doing a lot of flipping through the Bible today. A lot of scriptures to look up here. Ezekiel 20, verse 19. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and hallow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Who are the signs for? The Jews. the Jews. Yeah. They're not for Christians. Okay, the sign gifts disappeared after the Jews firmly rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Back you can read about in the book of Acts. After they rejected Jesus Christ, the sign gifts disappeared. Paul you know, no longer could heal people. He was sending people, you know, go and, and he told Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities and things. You know, he, he traveled with a doctor, you know. Why couldn't he heal himself? See, the sign gifts disappeared. And uh, there aren't going to be any more signs until the tribulation because that's the time of Jacob's trouble. But I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But what about when should a Christian worship? Go to John chapter 20. Does the Bible teach, does the New Testament teach that Christians must worship on the Sabbath day? We're going to look at that. John chapter 20, verse 19. John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, 
What's the first day of the week for uh, uh, in the Bible here? The Sabbath day would have been the seventh day, the last day of the week. The first day of the week would be Sunday. Not Monday, that's our first day of the week, but the first day of the week in the Bible is Sunday. Okay, back to verse 19 here. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And then he taught them. Okay? And he goes on to talk about that. But Jesus came, and by the way, it's after the resurrection. It's in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. All right, turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. We're going to look at the next one here. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. All right. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. <laughs> Sounds like a good service. You know, preach until midnight. So I'm not going to do that today. Don't get excited. But, you know, when was it? Oh, it was the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is the only day that you can worship as, as a true believer. In a, yeah, it was the first day of the week. It was Sunday. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Where are we going to go next? First Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given an order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. When was the gathering made? First day of the week. Okay, so you have three places where they are clearly getting together and studying the Bible, taking up offerings to send to the saints at Jerusalem, and Jesus Christ is teaching them, and they're all the first day of the week. And of course, then you say, well, then the first day of the week is, is the one that we must keep. No, not actually, because go to Romans 14, verse 5. Okay, Romans 14, 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Do you have to worship on Sunday? No. In fact, if you live in communist China, the dumbest thing that you could do would be to have your house church meeting from 9 to 12 every Sunday. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> you know, if you're a Christian in Pakistan, don't have your Sunday morning service. Okay? Not a good idea. <laughs> you're going to get caught. You know, you might be in a country as a Christian, and the Lord planned it that way because he knew the Christian church was going to be persecuted. So to force a specific day of the week, and you must worship this day from such and such a time to this time, no. You don't have to do that. You know, Sunday is a good day to worship because most people have awful work and whatever, and it's, you know, it's fine. I wouldn't, you know, you don't have to go out of the way to not do Sunday or, you know, or to, to make it different each week. Whatever. Do whatever works best for the people. You know, we have a Thursday night Bible study simply because Wednesday night doesn't work. Okay? No big deal. All right? So, but now let me just say again. If the whole Bible is for us and we have to make the whole Bible line up with all the other Bible, well, how do you reconcile this? A command to keep the Sabbath and then them worshiping on the first day of the week. I mean, were the early Christians, were they sinners? No, they weren't sinners. There's a different dispensation there. Something changed. Uh, next, we're going to look at uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and 29. You know, there's a little kid's song. I think probably most of us here are familiar with it. It's every chapter in the... No, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. Uh, that's a lie. 
Every chapter, every verse, every line is not for Christians. So you got to be careful of that stuff. See, it's just that sloppy way of going about it where you don't take the time to study and you just say, well, the whole Bible's mine. I don't want to go through and, and rightly divide it because that takes a lot of time. That takes study. So I just want to be sloppy with it and just go through and just, oh, yeah, it's all, all for me. you know. And what happens? You make a mess of your belief system. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay. Again, there's a whole other movement here that you say that you're a Messianic Jew or, you know, all these people out there. You're not supposed to do that. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Okay. What are you? You're a Christian. That's what you're supposed to be. Now, is that a doctrine which is taught all throughout the New Testament? No. We read earlier where Jesus told them, don't go into the way of the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Canaanite woman that came to him and she you know, wanted to have her daughter healed and everything. And, and he said, you know, it's not meat for the master to take the bread and give it to dogs or whatever but he's only you know i'm only here for the lost sheep of the house of israel see there was a distinction there but will there be a distinction in the future turn to james chapter one we're going to see another place here where it's very clearly written to somebody else you know for a christian it doesn't matter what race you come from. If you're a Jew, if you're a Gentile, you're to be called a Christian. But look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. To the twelve tribes? Where are the twelve tribes at right now? Are there any out there? No. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. Go over there. We're going to see where the 12 tribes show up. Okay, the Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, try to say that they, the 144,000, which we're going to look at here in Revelation 7, they try to say that they are, that they have the 144,000. <laughs> they don't. Uh, but let's, Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were, were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So the 12 tribes show up again in the tribulation. Why? Because it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Right now you are in a period of time where God is dealing with the Gentiles and the Jews as well. But the fact is, he makes no distinction between the two. He doesn't say, oh, wonderful, we got to save Jew down here. Oh, we got to save Gentile. He says, oh, a Christian. And that's what we're supposed to call ourselves, Christians. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the disciples were called Christians, first in Antioch. God makes no distinction now, but he does in the tribulation. Okay? Again, a dispensational change there. A dispensational change happens with the rapture of the body of Christ. Okay? We're not going to look at those passages. I did another message on it. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Very clearly, the body of Christ, those, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first. You know, it's something happens there. And like I said, I did a whole other study on it. But when the body of Christ is taken out, this dispensation ends and a new dispensation begins. And to teach otherwise is plain down heresy. And we'll look at a couple reasons why here in a minute. Now turn back to Matthew chapter 24. Verse 30. This is kind of a deep subject, I realize, but um, it's very important to cover this. And, uh, you know, a lot of lazy Christians are just going to shut this off because it's too much for them and, and whatever, and then they shut their brains off because it's too much to think about. It's a lot easier just to go through the Bible and just say, well, Every promise in the book is mine. You know, that's a lot easier. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. 
And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's at the end of the tribulation. Okay, the Jews are going to be restored as, as they already are a nation, but the twelve tribes will be restored, and they are the ones that will be there in the tribulation. They are the ones that will go through it, and they are the ones that are going to see Jesus Christ visibly coming. And you can read about that in Revelation chapter 19. When the rapture happens of the body of Christ, it's in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? It's not, every eye's not going to see him. It's going to be a mystery. That's why Paul, one of the reasons why he said it's a mystery. Okay, now look at verse 15. Here's another very important distinction between dispensations. It says here, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. All right. The abomination of desolation there is the Antichrist, and he is standing in the holy place. What's that talking about? Turn to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1. Okay, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Our gathering together there, by the way. It's Christians being gathered to Jesus Christ. It says that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. See, back then there were even people teaching that there is no rapture. You're going to go through the tribulation, then you'll see the day of the Lord and whatever. Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then the next couple of verses there, verse 5 down through about verse 9, talks about what is stopping the man of sin from showing up. He who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Okay, it says. Now, what is stopping the Antichrist from showing up? Again, it's covered in the, you know, when will the rapture happen sermon, so I'm not going to cover it here. But the thing that's stopping him is the body of Christ. Okay, God is not going to pour out his wrath for seven years on the body of Christ. That's heresy to teach that. It's ridiculous. Okay, so, and, and of course you read about it. You have the rapture happening, and then there's a great multitude in heaven that's redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from every tongue, every kindred, every nation. Read about that. I think it's Revelation 5 where it talks about that. And Revelation chapter 6 shows up. And the first seal is open, and the Antichrist is revealed. Okay? The body of Christ is in heaven before the tribulation begins, before the Antichrist is revealed. And that's very important to remember that. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Now remember, the Antichrist is going to stand in the holy place. Now what is the holy place for a Christian? Let's look. Second Corinthians, excuse me, Second Corinthians 6, 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. What's the temple of God? Well, let's look at another verse here. Make it even clearer. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. We're going to see exactly where this temple of God is. If you couldn't figure it out there from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Look at verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? 
If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, how can you reconcile Matthew 25, or Matthew 24, verse 15, and these passages here? Is the Antichrist going to stand inside all the Christians? No. The holy place for a Christian is your own body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Ghost. That's what it says. See, you can't reconcile these things. You can't bring them together and just mesh them together. You have to make one of them lie. You have to make one of them contradict the other. doesn't work. Now turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Again, here we have a doctrine for Christians today. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Very familiar passage here. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right. Uh, well, before we go to another one here, I just want to point out: keep your hand there at Ephesians uh, two eight and nine, but go back to Second Corinthians five seven. I should have looked this up when we were right in that area there, but that's okay. We can turn back. No big deal. Second Corinthians five seven it says, "For we walk by faith, not by sight." Can we see God right now? No. Unless you die. <laughs> then you'll see Him. You know, we can't see Him right now. Can we see signs and wonders? No. Unless they're fake. You can see some of those. But the point is, we walk by faith right now. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The only physical connection that we have to Almighty God is the King James Bible for the English-speaking people. That's the only connection we have to God at this point. Now turn to back to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Keep your hand there. Now go back to James chapter 2. Now remember, James 1, 1. James to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. He is pointing out who he's addressing. And when do the twelve tribes show up? They show up in the tribulation. So, who's this referring to? James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Well, come on. Can faith save you? Yeah. It can now. Sure, it can now. Exactly. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of works, verse 9. Well, oh, we have a contradiction here. The Bible contradicts. The Bible's not true. It's, a, it's, a, it's lies right here. No, it's two different dispensations. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? And it takes a little bit more study. That's why a lot of the lazy brethren don't want to do it. They just want to, oh, the whole book is mine. Everything in there from Matthew to Revelation, it's all mine. No, it isn't. Turn back to James chapter 2. Look at verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, a lot of people say, well, see, it's actually saying that faith is how you get saved, but then you should have good works meet for repentance. You know, they'll try to tie it in that way. But that doesn't work. Look for, down at verse 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. How do you reconcile that with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That right there is saying, no, it's not by faith only. Look at verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, that's true for a tribulation saint. We're going to look at that in just a second, but it's not true for us today. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. You can let go of the Ephesians there. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. We're going to look at that quick. It's kind of interesting, just a little sideline here. 
Martin Luther was known to say that uh, he would like to start his fire in his fireplace with the book of James. And a lot of people, you know, oh, he was a heretic because of that. No, it's just Martin Luther was not dispensational. He, he did not look at the Bible dispensationally. So his big thing was the just shall live by faith. And he was preaching faith plus no works, which is right for a Christian. But then people were saying, well, what about James too? And he was racking his brain. Well, how do I make it reconcile? Oh, I wish I could just burn that book. That's the way he felt. Well, all he would have had to do is just be a dispensational believer. Read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Rightly divide the word of truth and say, well, it's obvious. This is written to the 12 tribes. They show up in the tribulation. Is there faith and works in the tribulation? Revelation chapter 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Now, notice there it said, If any man. Any man. Saved or lost. If any man. Verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with, with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Faith plus works. Can faith save him? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. There are faith and works in the tribulation. You cannot take the mark of the beast. It's If you do, it doesn't matter how good a, a person you think you are, how many times you've prayed that Jesus would save you, doesn't matter. You take the mark of the beast, instant ticket to hell. Doesn't matter what Timothy LaHaye says. You can't take the mark of the beast and be saved. It's impossible. Uh, look at, turn back to Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. We're going to look at something else, which this is a phenomenal verse. I mean, you could do a whole message just on this one verse. I keep going, going across this, and, and I need to mark it. Uh, Revelation 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, now look at this, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Now think about that. Can you see God right now? No. Will you be able to see him at the end of the tribulation? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every eye is going to see him. And they're going to be hiding, you know, crying for the rocks to fall on them to, to hide themselves from him. You know, it isn't going to be, oh, here comes Jesus. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's going to be, People are going to be running. It says back in the Old Testament, I forget where it's at, but it says about they're going to flee away naked. You know, the mighty men are going to run naked. They're going to be, they're going to, in the house taking a shower, here comes Jesus Christ. They're going to run out of the house, be running, you know, back through the woods, scared to death. You know, you can mock him now. He's long suffering, he's patient. But that time is coming to an end. There aren't going to be any more atheists. Okay? And let me just, make a point here before we go on to the last point in this message how are you saved right now faith plus nothing faith alone is how you're saved okay you're not going to find faith plus works in the pauline epistles not going to happen how are you saved in the tribulation how are people saved in the tribulation we're not going to be here for it how are people saved in the tribulation faith plus works now, how are people saved in the millennial kingdom? Works. No faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Yeah, faith is the evidence. Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. I was paraphrasing. Making my own version. Uh, you know what I meant. Um, <laughs> the point is, you can't have faith in something that you can see. Okay, I don't need any faith at all to see my to believe in my Bible. My Bible's laying right here in front of me. Now, right now, I need faith to believe in God. I can't see Him. 
I need faith to believe in Jesus Christ because I can't see him. In the millennial kingdom, how could you have faith? You know, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, he's over in Jerusalem. Yeah, I believe I, I was at Jerusalem the other year. We had to go up there to, you know, to bring our oblation or, or whatever, you know, to the Lord. Yeah, I saw him. I saw him on the throne. I bowed down. How can you say that faith is going to be the means of salvation from now till eternity? You see the mess people get themselves into when you don't rightly divide the word of truth? Salvation changes with each dispensation. That's not heresy. That's Bible doctrine. And the sloppy, non-dispensational Christians make a mess of the Bible because they don't. they try to ignore that. And therefore, they are a workman that needs to be ashamed. All right? And I'm going to really kind of expose one here by the, before the end of this thing. But if you turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. Another dispensational change that happens, and this is one where Christians get really, really, really messed up on this. And every false prophet out there, this is their favorite thing to use. And I'm going to expose how they bring people into bondage. Okay? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12. Here you have for Christians. Let's read about this. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay? If you trust in Christ, what is that? It's faith. Okay? Christ isn't here dying on the cross. It happened once, almost 2,000 years ago. And you have to trust in that by faith. Okay, look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You are sealed when you get saved. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. We're going to see a very similar thing here. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It doesn't say you're sealed until the day that you backslide. And then you've got to get saved again. And then you're sealed until the next time you backslide. <laughs> you know? No. I mean, Christians would be sealed and unsealed so quick. You know, you know if it was a stamp, you'd get knocked out from how many times you're getting stamped. It doesn't mean that. You're sealed. Why? Because salvation is something that Jesus Christ did. Righteousness is imputed to you. His blood washes away your sin. Salvation is not something that I do myself. But guess what? It will be in the tribulation. Partly. In the tribulation, it's faith plus works. In the tribulation, you're going to have to endure to the end. You don't have to endure to the end of anything right now. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. How do you reconcile this stuff? You can't unless you are a dispensationalist. If you are not a non-dispensational believer, you're just going to make a mess of the Bible. It's crazy. Now turn to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to see another passage here that proves eternal security for a Christian today, before the rapture. First, or, uh, yeah, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? God did. And hath translated us un into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Okay? Who's the author and finisher of our salvation? Jesus Christ. We don't have to worry about losing our salvation. We have been translated. God took us and he brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay? Delivered us from the power of darkness. That's what happens when you get saved. You can't lose your salvation when you get saved. You can lose a lot of other things. You can lose your health. You can lose your joy. You can lose your money. You can lose your health. Well, I already said health. You can lose a lot of things, but you can't lose your salvation. You're sealed, okay? Because salvation, Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of it. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 
Second Timothy chapter two verse eleven. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Boy, you better get that one, you know, figured out. Better do some suffering down here. Uh, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Oh, no, that means if we don't witness for him, if if we don't stand up for him, then, then we'll be denied and we'll lose our salvation. Right? Wrong. <laughs> Look at verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says that we are members of the body of Christ. When you get saved, when you're washed in the blood, you become a member of Christ's body. Now, how can he deny himself? He can't. You're part of his body. He's not going to deny himself. Okay, and of course... He already went through the wrath of God on the cross because he took our sins on himself. Why would God put him through seven years of his wrath? That's ridiculous. is isn't going to happen. All right. The body of Christ will leave before the tribulation period, before the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, of course, you know, people are the uh, non-dispensational wing nuts out there are uh, just chomping at the bit right now. Well, he isn't going to he isn't going to read the verses in Hebrews because that disproves eternal security. Well, yes, I am. Hebrews chapter three. We're going to look at all the verses in Hebrews that prove that you can lose your salvation, and they do. By the way, you can lose your salvation if you are a Hebrew in the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews chapter three, verse fourteen. Now remember I said before Matthew uh, 24 says about um, in, you have to endure to the end. We'll look at Hebrews 3, 3 verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. See it? Enduring to the end for a Hebrew in the tribulation. Turn over to chapter 6 verse 4. Chapter 6 verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have taste of the heavenly gift, tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. You know, it would be rather shameful if you were a Jew in the tribulation, and you took the mark of the beast, and I do believe it's an implantable microchip, but I do believe it says upon the forehead in Revelation 14. Wouldn't it be something to take that mark of the beast and then turn back around and try to say you were a Christian? It would put Jesus Christ to an open shame, wouldn't it? But all the people right now that are saying that you can lose your salvation and they quote these verses here, read it. It says, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. So, in other words, if you sin, if you want to use this now for the church age that we are in, then that means if you sin one time, it's impossible to get saved after that. That can't mean us. That's ridiculous. Of course it doesn't mean us. Okay? Because if it did, there would be no Christians in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know one single Christian that hasn't sinned after they got saved. All right? It's it's just crazy. Turn over to chapter 10. We're going to see another doozy here that they try to use. Hebrews chapter 10. We're almost done getting there. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Now, here again, look at this. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth... There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Have you sinned willfully after you received Jesus Christ? Yes. Yep. <laughs> well, and nobody here is saved. Right? Wrong. Why? Because it's to the Hebrews. The Hebrews show up again in the tribulation. 
This has nothing to do with Christians in the church age. But in the tribulation, it doesn't matter how spiritual or how righteous you are. You take the mark of the beast, that's it. Your chance is gone to ever get into heaven. Okay, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. Revelation 7, verse 1. Now remember, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, Ephesians 4, 30, that we read earlier, that we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Was well, that true of anybody in the, in the tribulation? Yes. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then it goes on. The number is 144,000 from each of the 12 tribes. So there will be sealed believers in the tribulation. Okay? They don't have to worry about losing their salvation. They are eternally secure. But anybody else that wants to get saved, they have to endure to the end. They have to have faith plus works. You cannot blend this all together. It doesn't make sense. You make the Bible lie. The Bible talks about people that change the truth of God into a lie. Romans chapter 1. And sadly, the false prophets are coming out of the woodwork right now. And they are deceiving people into thinking that they're going to go through the tribulation. And I'm going to kick one because he deserves to be kicked and he needs to be kicked. And his name is John Weaver. And he's on Sermon Audio. And I recently just listened to a message of his where he talked about the rapture of the wicked. And his theory, which is the most ridiculous I ever heard in my life, was that 1 Corinthians 15, well, he didn't quote that, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is actually God taking the wicked out. And all you got to do is read the verses. And it says the dead in Christ. You know? And 1 Corinthians 15, it says that they will be given an incorruptible body. This mortal shall put on immortality. You know? Is God going to rapture the wicked out of here and give them immortal bodies? You know? And they so shall we ever be with the Lord? What? You know? But see, why does he teach? And why do these other false prophets teach that you can lose your salvation and that you can, you know, you're going to go through tribulation, you can lose your salvation? Why do they teach it? For the same reason that Rome has taught the very same things. Rome has taught since day one that they can pronounce an anathema on you and you lose your salvation. Why? Because that's the ultimate form of control over people. If I tell all of you here this morning that I have control of your souls and at any time, if you step out of line, I can damn you to hell. That's God's power. And man, in his sin, wants that power for himself because it draws people in and keeps them in bondage. If you don't listen to my ministry, if you're not faithful to my ministry, you're probably not saved. You're not going to endure to the end. You're not going to make it through the tribulation. You might lose your salvation. And so what these false prophets do is they sucker the people in and they, they prey on people that do not rightly divide the word of truth. And they'll use those verses to show you, you can lose your salvation. And then they have you. Then they can control you. And that's not of the Lord. And anybody that teaches that you're going to go through the tribulation, mark them down as a false prophet. Like it or not. Okay? And there's a whole bunch more. I'm going to probably do a message in the future on the dispensation that we are currently in, commonly called the church age. And what's not in the Bible? Yeah, I know that. But the point is, it's a description of this church, okay, that we are in the body of Christ. You know, you call it the body of Christ age if you really wanted to, you know. But I'm probably going to do a message on that, on our dispensation, on the rules for our dispensation, on our relationship to God through Jesus Christ, you know, in this dispensation. But you have to 
you know, going back to 2 Timothy 2.15, I'll just quote it one more time here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you disobey that command, you will never amount to anything for the Lord. You might be saved. This John Weaver guy and some of the other false prophets out there, they might be saved. I wouldn't say that they aren't. But the point is, God is ashamed of the way that they mess up the word and mess up believers. And God is not going to bless ministries that do not rightly divide the word of truth. So that's it for this morning.